Uh, we'll go live in just a second, another minute. Pay no attention to that man in front of the curtain. <clears throat> I'll try to not make my voice get too gravelly. Okay, I have seven, so I'm just going to start broadcasting, and then hey, we're thanks, live. Andy. <clears throat> hey, thanks, everyone, for joining us. This is Thursday, the 25th of June, 2020, the virtual or online meeting of the Newburyport Historical Commission. <clears throat> this is Glenn Richards, Chair, speaking. Uh, we have with us tonight Malcolm Conweth, Ron Zemba, Zemba, <clears throat> sorry, Patricia Pecknick, the Vice Chair, Joe Morgan, Christopher Fay, Peter McNamee, and um, no take of Gretchen Joy, and also joining us are the uh, uh, planner Andy Port and Caitlin Sullivan on the city planning staff. Uh, Andy Port is <clears throat> sharing his screen. If you're in the Zoom meeting and you can see that right now, you see uh, just a uh, uh, sort of an introductory document that talks about uh, public comment. <clears throat> Sorry, towards the evening, my voice tends to get a little gravelly, so I'll try to do my best. Um, so we have uh, one, I, the first time on the, tonight's agenda is about a dermal permit application, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. A few little brief uh, words since this is an online meeting. Uh, the commissioners are on the uh, panelists list and they will have their audio enabled. Uh, but even, even so, we do use uh, raising of hands to try to have a organized and um, non-conflicting uh, type of discussion. So we'll, we will do that. The attendees will always be muted, except if there is public comment period opened up uh, by myself, the chair. Uh, we may or may not have one, depending on whether there's a demo plan review called for, for Plumber Ave. Um, if, we, if, if there is, then th there'll be public comment allowed for that. And uh, when we get to 93 State Street, that's the Institution for Savings Expansion. I'm sure people are very interested in that. <clears throat> So uh, I'll, when we get to that point, I'll explain more about uh, how we're gonna conduct that particular discussion and uh, public comment and so forth for that. Okay, so uh, to keep things moving, uh, why don't we go ahead and start. Uh, we do have uh, the first item, which is uh, three Plumber Ave. It was an application for a demo per, demolition permit uh, involving a roof line change. Um, are, are the presenters uh, Geneviève, Blyler, is she uh, here? And David, is it Stolsatz? Are they here? Do they want to make any introductory remarks? Okay, see David, I see his hand is up. Uh, Andy, can you unmute him if he's not already? Yes, uh, it uh, appears to be a bit of a delay, but it, it should Oh, okay, be. yep, I see they're both unmuted. Okay, so, um, or uh, who, who's going to speak, is it? Um, I want to say Genevieve, that's a French pronunciation, or Genevieve, um, you'll need to, uh, we have you unmuted, but you'll need to unmute yourself uh, manually from on your application as well. Okay. Yeah, hi, this is John Blyler and- And Genevieve. And Genevieve, okay. can you hear us okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. Good, and, and with us is, is David Stulsatz, an architect from, from Ben Nutter Architects. David, are you there? Yes. Good. Well, thank you for, for having us tonight. Uh, please, uh, this is John, I'll, I'll, I'll do uh, just a very brief few opening words. Please interrupt me. This is, this is all new to me, so <laughs> I, I look forward to any guidance you, you, you folks have, particularly you know, from afar like this. So I'm John Blyler with Jenny. We, we are the owners of 3 Plummer Avenue. It's an 1854 Cape. Uh, that we intend to do a small addition off to the south or we would like to. We have a concurrent application filed with the ZBA special permit for nonconformities. The, the proposed project won't exasperate any nonconformities, but in order to put this modest addition, which essentially extends the living room and gives us some upstairs closet space and bedroom space, in order to proceed with that addition, we would like to demolish this porch that's outlined in crosshatch in the upper right hand corner of your drawing. 
It's a 98 square foot single story sunroom uh, that as far as we can tell is about 75 to 100 years old. It's not part of the original cape. It does not show up on a 1924 insurance map that Jennifer Blanchett holds. Uh, the architects tell us it's probably a World War II vintage porch that at some point somebody closed in. It has casement style windows. The rest of the house is double hung windows. It's on concrete pillars. Uh, and what we would like to do is, is remove this porch and put in a modest and I hope you would agree tasteful two story addition that, that again would provide um, you know, living space and, and, and bedroom space, first floor living space. The proposed project, it doesn't exceed any of the allowable lot coverage, doesn't intensify any, you know, non-conformances. That's probably ZBA rather than your purview, I, I think. But, you know, we worked really hard with, with Ben and Dave to, to uh, design an addition that would keep to the historic nature of the house and, and uh, be, be healthy and non-detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, so you can, you know, we, we've submitted a package of drawings here. You can see the small sun porch outline. There are some other uh, plan view and, and elevation drawings that were included with the package. Proposed addition will replace this 98 square foot sun porch with 156 square feet of additional living space on the ground floor and an additional 213 square feet of living space on the second floor and uh, you know the neighborhood has a wide variety of architectural styles there's a raised ranch and a daycare center immediately across the street from us several neighboring bungalow style homes from the little bit of research i did most of the homes seem to be 1920s 1940s uh heritage vintage although there, there are several uh newer homes on the street as well right so we i think it's a you know, the drawings, uh, me, again, really were, were done to, to provide a tasteful addition to the house. And I, I don't believe from my perspective as a lay person that uh, demolishing the sunroom would by any means uh, detract from the historical integrity of the house. In fact, that's one of the reasons we moved into the house is, is, is we love the, the, the heritage. Okay, so. well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Blyler. And you're, you're correct uh, that the ZBA deals with things like uh, setbacks and all that. We're mainly, what our task is twofold. First, we have to make a decision. We, meaning the commission, makes a decision as to whether the house is, and when I say the house, that's the entire structure. We don't look at a part of a structure. It's the entire structure, whether it's, quote, historically significant or not. And if it is, uh, we also, we have three choices. Either it's not historically significant, it's historically significant, but not preferably preserved. Usually that's when something is in such terrible shape or it's been so heavily modified or whatever. Or third, uh, which often happens, it's historically significant and preferably preserved, in which case we move on to the uh, demo plan review, which is when we take a look and discuss your actual plans and uh, agree or not whether to give the go ahead for the you know the actual demolition and and um build out that you've proposed okay so um let me first turn to my fellow commissioners here um would anyone like to uh comment on historical significance and i do see a hand my vice chair patricia pecknick would you like to make a comment uh, i think you're muted patricia I think it is historically significant um, in part because it was built in uh, 1854 by Michael Rooney, who was a ship carpenter. And then the Rooney family owned the house for the next 55 years and Plummer Avenue was originally called uh, Rooney's Lane. Um, I noticed that there is a plaque on the house. I'm wondering if that was put up by the current owners it gives the date 1854 and you know the prior owner took great pride in the house did a, a top to bottom renovation of the house left us with a stack of historical materials on the house as well as the plaque on the house oh great so you have the original deed and all that yeah oh good okay because we have it if you didn't have it i would send it to the chair to forward Thank it you. and and um 
I, I really appreciated the fact that in your application you included neighborhood views. That is required, but people seem not to do it very often. And particularly during the pandemic, it was nice to have those views for any people who, on the commission who didn't get over to look at those views. So I think it's historically significant and preferably preserved. And I say so on the way to saying that I agree it's a modest uh, project that I would support. Okay. Thank you, Patricia. Anyone else on the commission have a um, comment or question? Hmm. Very quiet. Okay. Well, Patricia, would you like to make a, a motion to that effect? Uh, you almost you almost sound like you almost made it there in your in your closing comment about um, uh, uh, looking for a motion that it's um, yes, a I significant. Will Yes, I would like to make a motion that it's historically significant and preferably preserved. Okay, is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, I think that was Mr. Fay, correct? Yes. Okay, very good. So uh, during these Zoom meetings, we don't, in live meetings, we don't always do a roll call, but we've been doing them here just to keep things uh, on the up and up and keep everything straight. So I'm just gonna take folks in the order they're showing up on my list here. <clears throat> Ron uh, Ziemba, you're, you're First up? Yes. Okay, yes. it's a yes. Thank you, Ron. Mr. Christopher Fay? Yes. Okay. Excuse me. Yep, you're good. Um, uh, Joe Morgan? Yes. Okay. Um, Patricia Pecknick? Yes. Okay. Peter McNamee? Yes. Okay. And myself is a yes. Uh, did we ever see that? Did we ever find Malcolm uh, anywhere? Um, he uh, he popped up for a minute and then he disappeared. I'm wondering if he's having a connection issue, perhaps. But uh, yeah, he, yeah, okay. I did speak to him earlier. He was, you know, he said his, you know, computer's running slow. This and that and the other thing. But we do have a quorum and we can continue. I had uh, one, two, three, four, but I had six yes votes there, including myself. So I think we're good to go. So what this means, is, uh, Mr. And Mrs. Blyler, is that we take a look at your demolition plan, which is pretty much what Andy is showing here. I believe this is one of your the supplemental documents you provided. And you also provided that list of materials, which was helpful. Uh, I mean, you've already pretty much outlined what, you know, what your demo plan is and what you want to do. So I don't think we need to go over that a, a second time. I just had one quick question about um, in the uh, uh, SDL, I assume that means simulated divided lights are called for is, is what is on the rest of the house today. It was hard to tell from the photo as far as windows. And they're, they're double hung uh, Anderson windows. Oh, okay. Which, so those which, are not old original windows or anything. The entire house was, was stripped to the studs as we understand it by our predecessor. Ah, I see. Okay. So those are, those are single divided, excuse me, simulated divided, blah. It's easy for you to say, simulated divided lights today in the existing house. Correct. Okay. All right. So, and I did see that you were planning to uh, match all the mid so so they, basically it's the same as with the sh uh, roofing shingles and the siding, the clapboards, the, the eaves trim, and all that. You're basically uh, having your addition match uh, what the rest of the house has Absolutely. today. Absolutely. Right. That's correct. Okay. Fellow commissioners, did, did anyone have a question or comment, either question for the Blathers or commentary on the plan? It's, it's a modest straight. plan. Yeah, it's a modest plan. I, I support it. Thank you, uh, Patricia. Um, anyone else? I, now, remember, if you do want to speak, uh, I can see that you're all muted on your end now. So if you do need to say something, you need to uh, take yourself off mute. I'll give it another second. Sounds like sounds like uh, not hearing any. So, would someone like to make a motion that we uh, give the approval for the project to go forward? Yes, I'll make a motion that we approve the project to go forward. Okay. Is there, is there a second? Second. Okay, uh, two, <laughs> two people spoke there. I'm not sure, so it was hard to tell who was that. Um, Ron. Ron. Ron, thank you, Ron. 
All right, so uh, Ron, as long as you're speaking, uh, your vote? Yes. Okay. Uh, Chris for Vay? Yes. Okay. Um, Peter McNamee? Yes. Okay. Uh, Joe Morgan? Yes. Okay. Patricia? Yes. Um, I, I am a, a yes. That's one, two, three, four, five, that's six again. Okay, so that is a unanimous vote then. So what this means, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Blyler, uh, is that uh, we agree with you that your proposed addition is not going to have a deleterious or adverse effect on the historic uh, pro property or the in locale. Uh, it'll, I think it'll be a reasonable fit. I think it'll blend well with your both with your house and the surrounding houses. So um, you're, you're free to, uh, there's no obstacles to getting your demolition permit to proceed. Well, we really, really appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you very much, folks. Okay, you're, you're quite welcome. And if you, by the way, if you stay young on the meeting for any reason, you can lower your hand now. <laughs> Once you raise it, it stays raised until you manually lower. Uh, okay, yeah, I, I will stay on for a little bit, but thank you so much. <laughs> you're, All right welcome. Now. you're welcome. Okay, very good. So it takes care of the first item on our agenda. Uh, the second one is probably going to be generate a bit more discussion. So let me give it, I have a little bit of preamble here. Um, the New Report Historic Commission uh, had a, a statutory obligation to provide a historical report to the planning board earlier this year when this first came up with the planning board. The, this I'm referring to is the expansion by the Institution for Savings. Uh, so the initial plans uh, were reviewed by this board and we wrote up a report. I say we, I wrote it up with input from the other commissioners. <clears throat> um, and that, so that statutory duty ha has already been fulfilled and was pretty much over and done. Uh, re more recently, meaning the past a oh, couple of weeks or so, give or take, uh, the planning board uh, has asked us, this commission, to please take a look at the newly revised plans and provide any additional comments which we might have uh, along the lines that we are, you know, that this body normally does. So um, to, in order to make perfectly clear uh, what this body does, uh, Patricia has a little uh, preamble on it that she's going to read in just a minute that explains what the ordinance calls for and what what is exactly we're doing. And I should and um, this is a public meeting, but necessarily not necessarily a quote public hearing. So I have discretion as to whether or not I allow public comments. There'll be more on that later. So uh, Vice Chair Pecknick, uh, you have your your short description, which I thought was uh, uh, well done. Would you um, go through that now, please? Uh, yes, and, and um, Peter has his hand up. I'm not sure if we need to. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, just I, I'm a neighbor of the bank and therefore I'm an interested party in this. So I'm going to recuse myself for the duration of this agenda item. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, appreciate that. So you can um, uh, just put yourself on mute, and we'll pretend you're we'll pretend you're not on the panel for now. Uh, you can listen in as a member of the public, is my understanding. Uh, but thank you for that. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, I didn't, I did not see his hand. I was on another screen. I've got uh, too many windows going here. Yeah. So just to open our deliberations, uh, the DoD ordinance requires adherence to any relevant provisions of the United States Secretary of the Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties, as they may be amended from time to time, including all related guidelines, bulletins, and other official guidance promulgated by the National Park Service. Those are the words of the DOD ordinance. We have each on our own time read these documents closely, and now we as a commission must advise the planning board on whether or not the plan as proposed is sufficiently protective of the historic structure and of the surrounding neighborhood and historic district. Inherent in preservation theory and explicit in all official Department of Interior guidance and in each of the bulletins and technical publications is the requirement that a new addition on an historic building be compatible with the scale, massing, and design of the subject building and also harmonious with the context building surrounding its site. Standard one of the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation references the building's site and environment, 
Standard nine refers to the historic integrity of the environment. The Department of the Interior's guidance on new additions to mid-size historic buildings likewise refers to the historic setting, advising that additions to historic buildings must be evaluated not only by how they affect the building itself, but by how they affect the district in which the building is located. Reading broadly across all National Park Service briefs on preservation and rehabilitation, we find that the Department of the Interior continually emphasizes the need to protect the historic setting and context of a property, states that the historic relationship between buildings must be protected, and explains that the standards also encompass the building's site and environment and other surrounding historic buildings in a district. The standards, therefore, are not just about the individual historic building as subject to alteration through new construction. They are about that subject building, but they also speak to, as the Department of the Interior puts it, the sense of time and place, feeling and association, the historic setting and context. The sense of time and place and feeling and association are congruent with what the DOD ordinance calls heritage, and the central architectural, cultural, economic, political, and social history of the city. Because the mission of the Historical Commission, as assigned to it by the city, is to protect, preserve, and promote New Reports historic structures, neighborhoods, and landscapes, this commission therefore has the duty and authority to fairly review the plan in its entirety to evaluate its impacts on the city structures and neighborhoods. We have the responsibility to encourage development that is sympathetic to the context buildings and settings, and that will preserve the sense of time, place, and community that is expressed by the coherent architectural aesthetic of downtown. Thank you all on the commission for grounding your own reflections and recommendations in that purpose. Thank you, Patricia, appreciate it. Um, so that's what we're about here. Um, and so this is a discussion amongst the uh, commission here. Uh, so I would want to hear from my fellow commissioners. I, I know that I did ask uh, that you know people consider this and um, prepare some comments so that we could um, move along fairly expeditiously. Uh, I know several of you have done that. Um, so, you know, whoever would like to go first, you know, simply raise a hand. We'll and we'll, um, you know, kind of go around the table and see what people's views are. Who would like to start? Don't be shy. Joe's hand okay. is up. Yep. I, yep. I, <laughs> I see Joe yeah, Morgan's hand. Go ahead. Yeah, Joe. Uh, you can lower your hand now, and you may speak. You are. You have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair Richards. I, uh, I have some comments um, regarding the proposed addition, uh, architectural comments um, that are that will address the scale issues that we've heard so much about, as well as the character, the architectural character uh, uh, of the building relative to its um, neighborhood setting. I wanted to first of all. <laughs> at the risk of, of boring everyone with uh, some numbers, I'd like to step through uh, an alternate way of just getting a handle on the uh, the, the size of the addition at, and it, as it uh, relates to the original 1871 bank structure. And we've seen a lot of data on square footages, and I know it confuses um, pe people. It confuses it confuses me. I, I've been an architect for many years, and uh, we, we see net numbers, we see gross numbers, we see different types of uh, representations of the, the, um, the building footprint and square footage. Uh, the, 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 of course, in this particular building, it's tricky because so much of it is not counted in the net usable areas because it's an open parking deck on the first floor. So we have to look at it another way, and I think there's clearly another metric that can help us. And, I've just calculated the volume above grade, simply taking the footprint uh, of each structure as it meets grade and um, multiplying it times the height. So uh, I did that for the 1871 building. 
off of the VGSI uh, assessor uh, thumbnail. Um, and uh, I got about 3,600 square feet. But the, what's interesting about the original building is most of it is at 24 feet uh, high. The, uh, the roof, which I uh, measured uh, in the field, is about 24 feet. About 70% of that building is about at 24 feet with a pop-up uh, in the center, which uh, has an average height of around 32 and a half feet. And that, that pop-up is about 30% of the footprint of the building. And I confirmed this from, from with Google Earth. So it's pretty close to what the assessor's information gives also. Um, so the uh, volume when I calculate it for that building is about 96,700 cubic feet. Um, now, when I go to the uh, proposed addition, we got some additional information from the applicant, I believe on the 8th of June, uh, and still, I had a hard time un understanding those numbers. They're presented as uh, floor area and building area. So I took the building area, which was about 16,000 square feet. I assumed that was, uh, you know, outside of wall uh, over two floors. So I took half of that, about 8,000 square feet, and I multiplied it times the nominal 30-foot height of the building to come up with uh, about 241,000 cubic feet. Um, and uh, so if, if people are still awake, I'll give you the punchline here. The, the volume of the proposed addition uh, as a ratio to the 1871 structure is almost right exactly at 2.5, all right? So it's two and a half times the volume above grade of the 1871 structure. So now, now we have a data point. I, I don't know what we actually do with that. We, we understand that it's a, it's a fairly large structure relative to the historical structure that is really under discussion and driving a lot of this, um, this analysis. But um, at, at this point, um, it, you know, I'd rather actually just talk about the perception of the addition from the, from the street edge and as we walk around it and, uh, uh, and, and just look at it uh, as a, um, as a uh, uh, an element in the its two contextual settings, both the State Street side side and then the neighborhood side, and that way we we can talk about the perceived mass of the building um, in a in a more uh, palpable way. Um, so at this point, let me let me let me give you my comments relative to um, my my, uh, my my perceptions relative to the architecture of the building. Um, uh, starting with the State Street elevation, which, you know, if you were standing on the corner of Prospect and State, you're looking at this, what I call sort of a courtyard, and I see the historical building, which is uh, a masonry, uh, stone and brick with some, with some substantial detail at its very, uh, uh, very ornate entrance. And then I see a continuation of the brick material on the 1980 edition, and then I see a proposed uh, addition uh, at the rear of the site, which is also um, uh, which is also brick, and all that's well and good as it should be, I think, to sort of define the boundaries of this courtyard space. That seems to make a lot of sense to me. Um, however, um, I think as we move to the back side of the site, the site, the eastern side of the site, facing the neighborhood, I feel that there's a an, a lost opportunity to make a transition at that northwest corner of the uh, of the addition on Prospect Street, so that we can sort of terminate, we can anchor that edge of the building and sort of finish our backdrop, if you will, our background around that courtyard, and then to transition to something that's more sympathetic to the neighborhood. Um, I think that the that that anchor point, which could be volumetric, could be sort of a punctuation that relates back both to the original 1871 building and also maybe to uh, the sort of the corner folly structure of the uh, of the clock tower and fountain. Um, I think that's something that could be reinforced that edge, that corner. And I spoke about a transition zone. I think that once you turn that corner, we really want to start seeing materials that uh, 
uh, echo the more traditional neighborhood materials of clabbered and, uh, um, and wood trim at, at openings and uh, at, a, at a cornice line. Um, I, I think this is, it is a challenge. I'm not here, I'm not going to provide any specific solutions. Clearly there are proportions and scale items that uh, the applicant has been struggling with because that floor to floor height in the addition is 16 feet and it does not, <laughs> it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's not a neighborhood dimension or a, a living room dimension. So it's a, it's a tricky dimension to work with and to respond um, uh, uh, and respond in a, uh, a consistent way with what with the wood frame structures that it's uh, actually trying to relate to. Um, however, I think the material um, that the material should very should match the wood frame structures and the window sizes and the trim boards uh, should uh, start to pick up and um, uh, begin to harmonize with um, the uh, residential structures. Uh, the next Gerald, item. Gerald, pardon the interruption, just so that yep. everyone is following along. So uh, in this image we're looking at now, I assume you, you also see the image that, that Andy is showing on the Zoom? Yes. Okay, so the that wall that you described as possibly or potentially terminating that courtyard, that's to the right where that sort of dogwood tree type thing is with the, it's got these, um, uh, yeah, that rusticated edge there and so forth. And then, so so it's it's from that wall kind of north-ish facing towards the back where we've got those bays and stuff. This is the area you're now talking about as what you're referring to as possibly trying to transition to more of a neighborhood context, am I right? That's right. I, I think that what, 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 what's <coughs> happening there right now, which is a, a balcony uh, serving, it looks like maybe a, a second floor uh, conference room or some, some interior space uh, that could access the exterior there. I think it's doing just the opposite. I think it's actually weakening that, weakening that corner and rather than uh, terminating it and actually then inviting another kind of uh, party that moves further down the street toward the neighborhood. I think that the, the whereas I appreciate the gesture, gesture of the, the two projecting bays, I think they showed some contextual pictures of bays uh, over on Otis Place. I think that they're so overscaled that I don't believe uh, they're really doing what we want them to do. They're actually um, it, uh, they're, they're actually uh, overpowering some of the smaller uh, residential uh, uh, scales that we find in the in the windows uh, uh, and other you know door openings or entry openings that we see along the street edge. Um, I. I, um, again, I, I appreciate the, the, the difficulty of being able to integrate that 16 foot floor to floor uh, of the garage, which has to accommodate its, its uh, car uh, racking uh, apparatus. But uh, I think that by emphasizing the oversized window with these bay projections, I don't think this is really helping us very much. Um, I think there are other things that could be done to articulate the facade in a residential scalar, uh, and I think I think some of that would be uh, both the would be the, the vertical scaling in terms of the windows and the openings, but it also could be a horizontal scaling where we we stop the facade or we provide an inset or we offset the facade a bit in order to produce uh, dimensions that are house dimensions. Uh, the, if, if this is an office floor, we already have something programmatically that resembles rooms. We have room dimensions. Those room dimensions could work in terms of fenestration. Could be, could be, uh, you know, they, they could be, uh, uh, they can be communicated and and uh, uh, grouped in a way that would show sort of a residential scale uh, room dimension, and that could also be carried into maybe a house dimension just by breaking up the vertical scale of the um, of the facade. Um, but again, I, I, I can't, I, I know that this is a challenge and I know that it requires some more research. Um, the, the last item that I would propose is that the cornice, uh, which as we see it here, which is very heavy, I believe the material might actually be a metal, maybe even copper, but I think it's very heavy. 
Um, and it's, uh, I, I, I don't feel that it's really appropriate facing the, the neighborhood. I, again, I think a neighborhood gesture of just a wood frame cornice or eave would be, would be quite nice. And I think it should drop, uh, rather being at 30 feet, it should drop down into the 20 to 24 foot range, which really is the matching datum for many of the eaves and gable ends that we, that we see in the neighborhood, as well as the 24 foot dimension of the 1871 historical structure. Um, so um, I, I believe that's all I really had, um, I had uh, Chair Richards from my, from my uh, uh, point of view here, I think uh, uh, I think those those few suggestions, if they could be explored, might actually lead the um, lead to a, a couple of other solutions that might be well worth considering. Okay, thank you, Joe, very much. Um, <clears throat> I think I saw Ron's hand up. Uh, Ron Ziemba, did you want to um, say something? Yes, if I may. Um, yep. I don't know how I'd feel about this project if I lived in that nice house on Otis Street that sits just a few inches from the property line with the bank, or in the pretty Cape on Prospect Street, which may end up with less sunlight when the garage is built. Don't know about that. Uh, I can certainly understand why some residents of the quiet neighborhood around Otis Street might not embrace what the IFS has proposed here to replace their parking lot. I appreciate the concerns and respect the opinions of the nearby neighbors and others, but I wanna be sure that all of the important factors are taken into account. You know, banks sometimes have big targets painted on their backs, hmm. just as a matter of principle. I'm hopeful that's not going to be the case here. For me, this particular bank is like any other successful community-minded business in Newburyport. The Anna Jakes Hospital, the firehouse, even the grog, each in its own way, all contribute to the betterment of Newburyport and are an important part of why we love it here as much as we do. So my remarks are gonna focus on a completely different aspect of this, um, but I hope uh, you'll agree uh, an equally important aspect. I had a very hard time reaching my own conclusion on this project. I reviewed and analyzed both proposals carefully, and I tried to put myself in the place of the owner of a home in the neighborhood. But at the end of the day, I was also guided by the historical context here, or if you will, extenuating historical circumstances, such as the institution has been common, uncommonly successful from the standpoint of assets, deposits, mortgage loans and the like. And it's also made significant financial and non-financial contributions to the betterment of Newburyport. The city's nonprofit ventures would be much well, much less well off, indeed, without the support in dollars and volunteers of the institution. I hope we can take these important factors fully into account as we decide this matter. Two hundred years after its founding, the IFS is widely recognized as one of the most stable mutual banks in the nation. The bank's reputation is strong and steady, uh, as strong and steady goes far beyond its architecturally significant main office building built in 1870 and long considered a historic landmark in the great world. As a further me measure of its stability, the bank has known only 16 presidents in its 200 year history and all of them have been hired from within. The bank's well-deserved reputation as community-minded is due in large part to its trustees, officers, and employees, many of whom are quite active in their communities. In years past, when Newburyport nearly turned its downtown into a strip mall, 
this bank and its people helped to stop the demolitions and lead the revitalization of the city to help make it the thriving community it is today. For 12 consecutive years, the bank has been named a top place to work by the Boston Globe. I think most of us participating in this meeting tonight probably know and respect at least one person who works for the IFS. In these and other ways, the bank has demonstrated the ways in which it is, in fact, knitted into the very fabric of Newburyport. The IFS has always believed in dedicating part of its assets toward making its communities better places in which to live and work. The Institution for Savings Charitable Institution, that's a mouthful, is a vehicle to guarantee the future get for future generations the charitable giving that has been the bank's hallmark since 1820. In the last five years, the foundation donated and pledged more than $13 million to community organizations and causes, including a landmark $1.5 million to construct a new single patient unit at Anna Jake's Hospital. Based on its outstanding track record in this city over the last 200 years, I believe the IFS deserves to have this opportunity to add to its existing campus on State Street. It deserves the opportunity as a well-run successful bank and as a generous and engaged corporate citizen of our community. And whether the details of design are derivative or compatible is much less important to me. What is important is providing the IFS with the addition to their campus they need to continue to do their good work in Newburyport. I think the bank has very much earned that opportunity over the past 200 years. I believe this project should be examined carefully and objectively with all these extenuating historical circumstances very much taken into account. I think the bank deserves no less than that. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Excuse <clears throat> me, thank you, Ron. And I think a lot of us would, ag would agree with your sentiment about uh, the nature of the bank's reputation and its contribution to the city over the years. Uh, I would be very surprised if any of us were not already customers of that particular bank. I know I have been since around 1980 or 81. So I have a long relationship with them. And, uh, you know, I think how that how I reflect that is by, you know, giving them in this case, it, it, you know, the fairest and, and most impartial, you know, review that uh, that I probably can, uh, but thank that. So, so thanks, Ron. Um, I see uh, Vice Chair Pegnick, your hand is up. Would you like to make a comment? Um, yes, quite a, quite a few. Um, <laughs> I, I, I know, unsurprisingly, I, I, I saw that on the day that the Institution for Savings Employees moved into the, the 1871 building, the local newspaper uh, described the building by saying it is not imposing in size, but it is handsomely designed and elegantly finished. And I, I know that everyone on the commission hopes that the same will be said of, of the new addition that goes up. I have two points. Uh, the first being that a strong tenant in all Department of Interior guidance is the concept that an addition needs to be subordinate to the historic building. If, if you look at Preservation Brief 14, new exterior additions to historic buildings. Um, in its volume and its height, it, it makes the historic building subordinate. I was very interested to hear Mr. Morgan's calculations that the above grade volume is like 2.5 times more. And probably if we were to include the 1980 edition in the calculations of the ratio of historic building to additions, I don't know, maybe it would be three times more. And the, his, the comparison that we have to make has to be between the 1871 building and the proposed new addition, not between the 1871 building and the 1980 edition, because the secretary's standards are not seeking to protect the 1980 edition. They're seeking to protect the 1871 
um, building. I, a, a one or a one and a half story building might be able to join this pre-existing neighborhood context uh, and assimilate uh, into it. A building that that's height could probably reinforce the neighborhood scale rather than dominating it. I'm afraid that from anywhere other than the, the bank's front door on State Street, it's, it's going to read as a, as a mega project. And so besides the fact that it's not subordinate, it's not coordinated, and I think I heard Mr. Morgan talk about this. Um, Andy, do you happen to have the, the 1894 Sanborn fire insurance map of this? Sure, I'll pull it up. Neighborhood. Um, I, I, I will agree with, with uh, Mr. Morgan that we have to recommend that the design respond to the neighborhood context by making the Otis and Prospect Street facades compatible with the residential character of those streets. So, so this map shows the extent to which 93 State Street was historically embedded within a lot surrounded by wood frame dwellings. I have to say from an historic preservation perspective, if you want to be a purist, the ideal solution would be to restore the historic land use pattern and have two smaller buildings on the lot with green space between them rather than a more suburban scaled complex. That would be the highest level preservation response in an historic district, in an historic neighborhood, in a historic building. I do think a, a single building of a lesser volume can comport with the secretary's standards and the DOD ordinance if its design engages with it with its neighbors. And I'm persuaded by Mr. Morgan's remarks that it's possible. The surrounding streetscape here, Prospect Street, has its own form G that describes the houses, um, including the 18th century houses at nine and number 18 and 20. And I didn't know until yesterday that there was a form G for the Prospect Streetscape. And I didn't know that part of this neighborhood is actually in the R3 district and not the B2. And I thank members of the public who submitted letters to the commission providing that information. I know we've all spent many hours and sleepless nights thinking about it. I'm sorry that I missed those things. Um, in the application, there were photos of the way that houses and, and mill buildings coexist outside the DOD in other parts of the city because of course houses were built on lots around the factories so that workers could live in them. But this is the DOD. It's not the DCOD. And there was one photo taken in the DOD behind the Tracy Mansion of how houses were built when the Dodge Shoe Factory was there. But we can see from those photos what happened to all the houses that used to sit along Hills Court. They were torn down and it's a parking lot. And I think that shows us how such massive buildings can convert neighborhood streets into feeling like alleys. I agree with Mr. Morgan that an important design element is the fenestration. The tall rectangular vertical window openings are not compatible with the context buildings in the neighborhood. Preservation guidelines emphasize the total impression that new construction will make in the neighborhood setting and the historic district setting and windows are a critical element in that impression. I really respect what Mr. Ziemba said about the identity of the applicant, but I can't find anything in the secretary's standards or ordinances that suggests we should conform our analysis of the project to the identity of the building owner. I think if it were Planet Fitness or a sports arena or a college dorm, we're, we're here to represent the buildings and the neighborhood. So whether it's a philanthropic community member, and I appreciate that it is, but I don't think that should lessen or heighten our scrutiny of this project and how it will affect the neighborhoods. Uh, the secretary's standards are in that sense unexceptionable. They call for conforming to and preserving the character and scale of the existing neighborhood and context buildings. I also will echo what Mr. Morgan said that, that designing a subordinate and compatible addition on an historic building in an historic district is so challenging that the secretary's first piece of advice in the guidelines for new exterior additions to historic buildings is to consider whether it's even possible. 
we welcome, I mean, I welcome an addition that will be responsive to the context and not subvert the character of the neighborhood. Um, the Department of the Interior brief on building additions to historic structures in densely built neighborhoods emphasizes that it's important to design an addition that will have the least impact on the historic building and the district. Of course, there is not a no effect option, um, but this strikes me as a, as a high impact plan. I did look at how other Massachusetts cities with preservation ordinances have approached new construction projects. And I have to tell you that our Newburyport standards for community neighborhood compatibility are not even as high. The standard in some other historic cities is that the addition should make a real contribution to the setting so that the historic district is better off. That's not even the standard I'm applying. I, I just want the, the project to do no harm or, or to minimize the impact. The National Alliance of Preservation Commission standards and criteria warns very strongly about the potential for new construction to disrupt the integrity of the historic district. We're not even thinking about the entire historic district. We're just thinking about the DOD. The entire DOD with the Custom House and City Hall and the First Religious Society Church and the mail, and we're asking whether this particular addition makes sense as proposed in the DOD. And I have tried in my mind to have it make sense, and, and I can't. And finally, to quote the historical architect in the Office of Historic Preservation at the National Park Service, Stephen Simey, he says, to the degree that the existing neighborhood context has a positive, consistent, and valued character, and to the degree that the proposed design would substantially alter that character. The proposed design must bear the burden of proof for demonstrating that the benefits to the neighborhood context and to the city as a whole will outweigh the residual unavoidable harm that would be done to the sense of place. The location of the burden of proof is upon the architects who propose the change. So applying the standards and ordinance to this plan as new construction to an historic building and an historic neighborhood and an historic district, I would recommend less height, less overall volume, improvements to fenestration and proper contextualization of the addition along Prospect and Otis Streets and in the hopes that when this addition is completed, the Daily News will say it is not imposing in size, but it is handsomely designed and elegant. <laughs> Right. Thank you, Patricia. One quick comment I'll make um, regarding um, your comment about the standards not including consideration of who, you know, who the owner is, the reputation, and so on, uh, that Ron talked about uh, quite eloquently. And I think that I should mention that um, while that is not uh, strictly a matter for the historical commission, although you know it's one of those things where you can't really and truly put it completely out of your mind, but the Zoning Board of Appeals, which is the um, governing body in terms of who ultimately decides uh, where what happens with this project, that Sorry. is certainly something that they can take into consideration. Sorry, Glenn, I just wanted to correct, yep. for, just for the record, uh, and anybody yep. listening, it's the planning board. Sorry, I just wanted to correct. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I'm sorry. It is the planning board. Yes, I misspoke. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Now, Ron, I see your hand is still up. Is that just because it's not put down yet, or did sorry you want to see Uh, okay, uh, Christopher Fay, uh, would you like to make a comment? I see you've raised your hand. Yeah, just a couple things. I, I appreciate what Joe said earlier, and it's, um, I think it really makes sense rather than, I don't know if he, if I misread his comments, but it seems like he's just flipping the script a little bit. He can correct me if I'm wrong. But rather than make the new proposed edition fit the bank, is he proposing to make the new addition fit the neighborhood? And, and what's, what's, with the, what's wrong with a different sort of building, I guess? Um, I, I don't recall, I, I can't tell the difference, what was proposed, what was revised. My guess is it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, nothing, nothing significant. I said this back, I guess, in January. 
I, I don't understand a parking. Can someone, and I'm going to ask you, Glenn, because I'm just for clarification, what is the purpose of a parking garage other than parking for the bank? And before you answer that, walking by this bank hundreds of times, I never see people waiting to get a parking space. So I guess mm -hmm. I, I need some clarification on the parking garage. I would not want to live in a neighborhood like this where I looked out my window. Uh, I moved into this neighborhood because, and I knew the bank was there. And I knew the addition was there. And I knew there was a parking lot. And the next thing you know, I wake up one morning and somebody's proposing putting a parking garage across the street or next door to me. So I'll, I'll ask my question now. Uh, what is the purpose of the parking garage? Okay. Uh, there's actually a couple of questions in there. I'll, I'll try to answer the first one about uh, Joe's comment. And uh, if I get it wrong, Joe, please um, uh, butt in. <clears throat> I think what Joe was saying, uh, Chris, was essentially what you said, but basically as you know where the drive-in window is in the uh, 1980s edition, um, that this edition kind of sweeps around if you're at the drive-in window, it would be right, right behind you. So that that forms a natural sort of courtyard where there's the existing parking lot, the, the little fountain up, you know, and the clock tower and so on. And it kind of, because the, yeah, you can see it here where that circle is, where the drive-in window is. And then, so there, there's that, what he referred to as the courtyard and that masonry wall. What I believe Joe was suggesting is that from that point towards Otis Place, you really, consider more blending with the neighborhood context rather than the State Street context, which is, you know, half a block away. See what I'm saying? So is that right. kind of what you had, what you were thinking, Chris? That was, I was thinking, and I was thinking, that's just brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Figure, like, how do we, how do we make this thing not look like, right? Uh, you know, and it, it never really dawned on me that if, if it's about meetings, it's about, park, forget about the park, the parking garages, that's, yeah, I'll get to that too. It's about so, meeting space or office space. There's plenty of people that have businesses, and I understand what Ron's saying, but there's plenty of people that have businesses that fit in with the with the actual landscape of the city, which is largely residential. Because right. the bank can make the claim we need a parking, but then the next step is like, you know, the the Agave's restaurant says, well, we need parking. So we want to blow out the back, you know, we want to do this. We want to do that. And one of the things I said in my comments to, to Glenn in, in the email was that um, it, 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 we have to take into account the people here. You know, for me, the houses and the buildings are, are connected to the people that lived in them or worked in them. The mills are there. There's nothing. We can't, we can't change that history. Um, but we can say, you know, this is too big. So I, I would really, I'm really intrigued by, by uh, Joe's idea that, you know, what I'm reading is build a house rather than, <laughs> rather than a commercial building. Or something uh, that is compatible anyway. And I, and I get why they want a building here connected to the original building because, you know, I was a customer of this bank as well. And what draws people in, I think, because to me, a bank is a bank. What draws people to this bank is the building itself. That's their brand. That's their trademark. And to me, it looks like they want to blow that up because this is definitely over the, but I think Patricia made a good point the the two new buildings combined overwhelm the original building mm -hmm. which is what attracts people to the bank it's mm -hmm. I didn't look at interest rates I just said this is a cool looking bank I'm gonna go <laughs> open in the bank yeah I, I suspect you're not alone I think my oh, sentiments no, were similar no. back and, around 1980 it's a rarity to see these banks these bank buildings that haven't been turned into a coffee shop or something else as you as you travel around places, right. this is still a functioning bank. And for, I don't know how many years, you know, over a hundred years, that building served the purpose. I know that they have buildings other places in the community. And one of the things I was thinking about, and it's maybe it's not a realistic comparison because down the street is TD Bank North, which is a much larger bank system, but they seem to manage to make it work within the confines of an historical building. Mm -hmm. And aside from a weird, you know, the, the drive-in window, drive-through windows, in the back there and a parking lot, um, I, I can do my banking at TD Bank and, and know that, you know, I can meet with people, I can get a loan, I can do all the things that I've done there. I just, I just, I'm perplexed by this. I really, really am. I, I, I don't see how, as I'm looking at this image Andy has up there, I just don't see anything. As I'm looking at this building, I don't see anything but 
that addition back there. And I fear that, I just don't think, I mean, off, off the historical thing, I just don't think it's very good. I don't think it's being a good neighbor and being a good part of the community, quite honestly, because you're just going to alienate people in the community. That's my two cents. I'm, I'm not in favor of this. I think that Joe's got a brilliant idea. I really do. So okay, and I see, I see Joe has his hand up. So uh, hang on just one second, Joe. I just want to respond to two quick things. And one is on the, I should point out that the institution recently spent a lot of money restoring their front steps and the f front facade of the historic building. And they did a really good job. In fact, I sent them a letter myself to, uh, to Mr. Jones, their president, thanking him for, for taking those steps. So they obviously, they understand the importance of that particular building. The other thing um, you asked about parking and I may ask for help from Andy here. My understanding is that um, there, in a our concern is around the DOD and historical preservation, blah, blah, blah. So we, we don't really get involved with the parking requirements that the zoning uh, laws get into, but <clears throat> a business is required to have X number of spots for X number of square feet of its business. Uh, Andy, uh, without getting to, you know, this parking is not our thing, but just to kind of help uh, everyone understand why they even put this garage in. Uh, can you make a quick comment about what the parking requirements may yes. be that, that drove that? Sure, so uh, different uses in the zoning ordinance require different levels of parking. So for instance, office space, uh, retail space, you know, different types of business uses have different requirements. In this case, uh, there is some additional square footage of, of office space being added. So in association with the bank activities. So that additional square footage requires additional parking um, to make sure there's enough provided by the business essentially on its own site or in its own way. Um, in this case, uh, like you said, the planning board has jurisdiction over that. Um, that uh, I think the applicant, based on all the information I have reviewed and I'm aware of, uh, the applicant uh, has sufficiently addressed that issue. And I think that'll be explained in obviously more detail to the planning board at their meeting uh, next week. But uh, you're right, it's the, the commission here has um, the advisory role and jurisdiction to provide comments on the, um, the design, you know, the addition, modifications, and so forth. But you're right that the parking is sort of beyond the scope of what right. the commission deals with, and it's properly in the jurisdiction and uh, realm of the planning board. Yeah, and it, it's for us, it's just kind of a complication because, as Joe pointed out in his initial comments, it you know drove the height of that first floor and created other problems. Joe, did you want to uh, make a comment? Yes, thank you. I first of all, I just wanted to uh, uh, thank uh, Chris. Uh, I really, I really do uh, respond very favorably to flattery. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's brilliant or not, Chris, but I do, I do want to clarify a remark that I said earlier about dropping the cornice line. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting that we drop the roof uh, from 30 feet to 24 feet, but we drop the cornice line that we find a a, a, a way of reducing the scale, the perceived scale along the street edge by dropping that cornice line. I, I shot a, a laser, my laser uh, to at the eaves of all along Prospect Street and I, I saw measurements of the three main buildings, uh, number 11 to, to number 21, those three buildings, I think it goes 11, 13, 15, 17, and 1921. Those three buildings, which were I think originally workers houses from the 19th century, those uh, those those uh, gutter lines, because you're talking about a roof overhang, is right at 23 feet. So, I think if we could get a cornice line down around 24 feet, I'm not saying drop the roof. I'm saying transition at that point, set back the windows maybe a foot or so from the edge, and then start a like a really uh, sharply inclined roof uh, plane. Um, so that we're actually mimicking what we see on the seats of the streetscape, uh, but we're actually, we're just, we're just not, uh, we're not giving you a 30 foot high wall there. Uh, and that's, you know, that's, that was my comment. It, I, I'm not critiquing the program, that the program requires a 16 foot floor to floor parking garage because they need to stack cars. <laughs> uh, uh, then so be it. And they need offices on top of that. And that gives them 30 feet. I think the, you know, the average roof heights of these buildings in the neighborhood, many of, you know, 30 feet is a good datum for some of these sloped, uh, for these, uh, you know, mid-slope uh, uh, residential buildings. 30 feet's not, 
out of uh, character for, or out of scale. It's just the way it's articulated here. And that's really my, the reason for my, my comment. So okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. Um, Joe, that's a, a significant difference. <laughs> and um, let's see, would anyone, any else on the commission uh, we haven't already heard from? I think, let's see, we've, we've heard, um, no, I guess we've heard from everyone except me. Uh, I'm gonna be very brief. Um, Can I just ask one oh, more question? Sure, no, I can't, uh, Chris. Is Joe, did Joe's proposing or thinking that this, this building could be built of wood? I heard wood. Is that is that correct, or my, did I miss that? Is it? That's you know, correct. It would be it would be articulated as a clabbered building, as right. a as a traditional wood frame uh, clabbered building with wood trim. Uh, the, the 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 way it's built could be done be be done with metal stud or uh, whatever backup, but the actual finished material would echo the neighborhood materials. And, and could it could it be built, you know, or designed to be nearly indistinguishable from the other houses that we see? in this image right here. Hmm. Not to be historic, not to, to pretend it's an historic building, but to at least right. try to be compatible with this streetscape here, as opposed to the sort of beginning of Prospect Street. Absolutely, right? I, I, okay. I think that there are architectural, um, there are architectural uh, elements that could be added and, and proportions and window sizes and window articulation that could actually make it uh, blend a lot better with this uh, particular street, yes. I think that's, sorry, brilliant. I think it's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And thank you very much, Joe. Uh, your comments are, uh, all your, everyone's comments are appreciated. <clears throat> So uh, for the sake of time, I'm, you know, most of what I've been thinking has already been said and perhaps even said better. Uh, I'll just say for myself, you know, I've mulled this quite a bit. I think there's an inherent conflict actually between the program, that is the requirements of the bank, the zoning requirements about parking, et cetera, and the locale, the context. Um, you know, uh, Joe's, you know, proposed, um, uh, you know, the, let me put it, let me rephrase it. The way Joe is kind of looking at that conflict, I think points in the direction of some, you know, possible ways of uh, remedying it. Um, but uh, it's, it's, I think it's gonna be very challenging as uh, I think Patricia noted that, uh, you know, it's um, sometimes it's, really, really difficult um, when you've got historic structure, you've got limited space, you've got program requirements, you've got all these conflicting needs, and it's very, very hard to, to find a good solution that will, it, at the very least, oh, well, will give as much of the program as possible with the least amount of harm to the context of the neighborhood. And I, I think it's that context in the neighborhood that we're really mostly focused on. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, not an architect. I've, I've, I've done most of my architectural research around the federal period. You know, I'm, I'm familiar with the other styles like Italian and, and all, et cetera, et cetera, like the, the main body of the bank and so on. Um, so, I don't want to present myself as a, you know, a design consultant expert. That's not what we slash I am here to do. I will comment though, and I think uh, someone else, it may have been Joe, made a similar comment. I think some of the things that the uh, architects have tried to do to um, not make a quote unquote nod to the historic structure don't quite come off as authentic. Uh, obviously, we're talking about a new building. Uh, can you go to uh, page 17, Andy? You know, but I think the, you know, the, the, the way, you know, I, as Joe said, we appreciate, you know, the idea of the bays, but there, when you look at them, in fact, I think if, uh, go one more page to 18, you can see those bays in more of a, you know, you can kind of see compared to the house next door, you know, they're just like way bigger. And, you know, we get it, we get it why, you know, this, but even, uh, so you've got, you know, it looks like uh, a dollhouse garage door because the garage door is X high. I don't know how high that is, but then you've got these huge bays. I don't know, it just looks like something that was tacked on to try to break up the facade, which, hey, I myself suggested breaking up the facade. So I can't criticize the, 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 
the motivation to break up the facade, I think that's that that was uh, that was the right thing to do. I think you know the the changes made to the windows. I think there's some positive changes there. I do agree with Joe. I think as far as um, you know, there's still no. Um, what would be, uh, I'm not sure if they'd consider it a horizontal articulation, basically like if you look at uh, this purchase street is on the right here and Otis Place goes off to the left where that, where that white building with the gabled, uh, excuse me, the dormers are next door. Uh, if, if you had something that where that, there was a cornice line or, or edge line, whatever, gutter line, whatever you want to call it, that was closer to the heights of those other residential structures. And then the upper floor either stepped back even a little, like a foot or so. Um, that might be all you need to break up that kind of hulking impression. And uh, I, I would echo Chris's comments that I think, <laughs> Joe, uh, well, I don't know if you call it a stroke of genius, but I think it was a really, it was insightful is the word I would use to say that, hey, you know, the this State Street is one thing, but here, you know, if you're, if you're on either Otis Place, Prospect Street or anywhere down in this neighborhood, you know, this thing like, whoa, where did this big masonry, the, this big brick building, where, where did this come from? It's totally now outside the context of the 1871-1872 building. So uh, I, I, I think uh, Joe's comments are very much uh, on point. So um, that's about all I have to, to, to add. I think, you know, your comments have been, been very well uh, taken and I'll try my best to consolidate those. I see a hand raised by Patricia. Is that a new, a new hand raised, Patricia? Did you want to add something? If you do, you're muted. Yeah, just a quick, a quick closing remark. Again, the highest standards for this because historic building, historic district, historic neighborhood. And I like what uh, Christopher Fay said about uh, the original building as being, you know, it is sort of more a landmark building than a commercial building. And just to borrow the, the urban theorist Jane Jacobs said about landmarks that, you know, they're eye catchers and a landmark has to have a sort of reciprocal relationship with its, with its neighboring buildings. And I worry that, um, you know, it would be easy for a, this addition to communicate that those, that neighborhood isn't important. And I don't want that to happen to any neighborhood in New Report, especially not to one in the, in the, DOD. And I just want to thank everybody because I know everyone put a lot of thought and study and analysis into that and each one of us brings our own perspectives and thank you to the chair. Uh, you're quite welcome. Um, now, um, I've given a lot of thought about public comment and I know there are also attendees who are representatives of the bank. Uh, I know they're here. They I uh, imagine they may wish to say something. So here's, here's the deal on that. Uh, you heard what our purview is. You heard you know, what it is we consider and so on. Um, now, and I've already uh, reminded you that we're not the approving authority. That's the planning board as Andy pointed out. We're just giving them our opinion. Um, and it's in matters like the parking, security, water drainage and that sort of thing. Those are not under our purview. Um, <clears throat> we've already received several comments in writing, uh, such as from members of the Preservation Trust. I think uh, architect Nick Cracknell provided one. I think other abutters have provided some. <clears throat> uh, so those need not um, be repeated. We will, we read all those and take them into consideration. And um, they are, uh, they are part of the part of the, this record. But I decided that it given all the um, excitement, <laughs> enthusiasm, interest around this, I would allow a brief comments to be made if, if they are appropriate to our, um, to our purview. And um, so uh, please do, do raise your hand. And um, uh, if you wish to make a comment, 
and uh, please be brief because uh, we don't want to be here all night, none of us. So, uh, and I see uh, the counsel for the uh, bank, Lisa Mead has raised a hand. So in deference to the applicant, I uh, will let her make a, a brief comment uh, if she'd like to re you know, respond to anything we've said here. But uh, again, I would encourage you to, you know, uh, as I said, you know, Keep it brief. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, Ms. Mead, if you would like to uh, make a comment, uh, you're recognized. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to say the least that I'm surprised um, would be an understatement. Uh, the bank had prepared a, a presentation um, so that there would be back and forth with the commission as um, we had done in the past. Um, I'm very concerned about Mr. Morgan's comments, um, particularly since he wasn't a part of the commission when we originally started. And quite frankly, none of the comments I heard tonight were relate related at all to the original DOD historical report. I would further add that the commission can't just have a fantasy here. There is a reality and the reality is the underlying zoning the rights of the applicant to use their property in the context of that zoning, the fact that this is a commercial property. Um, you can't just pretend that the 1980 building doesn't exist. It does. It's a part of the structure now existing that we become a part of. Uh, Mr. Morgan's uh, comments relative to the vo volume of the 1870 building are is inaccurate. Um, the, as compared to the brand new building, the brand new proposed building is not 35 feet tall, which is what he said he calculated in his, um, in his uh, volume calculations. It's not 35 feet tall, it's 20, uh, 28 feet tall. Um, so I'm very concerned with all of the discussion that has just taken place as if this hasn't been a process at all. And as if you haven't already commented on what's been proposed. This is a commercial zoning district. It has zoning that has existed for a long period of time. The historic zoning pattern in the city of Newport has sharp transitions. There is no step back transition from one district to the next. The B2 district has zero setbacks, 40 feet height. The R3 district right next door, which shouldn't have been a surprise to anybody because it's been on all of our plans. So on the opposite side on Prospect Street and on the opposite side on Otis Place, yes, that's the R3 district. And the zoning makes a sharp turn down immediately, but not on the uh, southern side of the property, which is Otis Place, which is also the B2 district. So this is a commercial district. And the zoning, the historical zoning pattern is a sharp transition, which is consistent with the zoning patterns throughout the city of Newport, which is consistent with the current zoning patterns, the historic zoning patterns. And oh yes, even the proposed zoning that's been worked on for two years doesn't change. Even in the DOD, the transition pattern of the historic zoning. And so you must, I say, Take that into consideration when you're talking about somebody in the DOD commercial district with a commercial property for a commercial use, constructing a buy right use in a buy right building, but for the major site plan review and DOD advisory review. And I don't believe that you can discount the historic development in the city of Newport around the commercial manufacturing buildings and the wood frame structures. You're right, I don't recall who made this comment, that over on um, Prince Place in Hales Court, it's now a parking lot. Well, that doesn't mean it's wrong. There were wood frame houses are there and there are wood frame houses there now. And there is a major Tracy Place brick commercial building against the shoe factory building called the Bracket Hill building. And we have provided that evidence to you. And I would like my colleagues that are here with me tonight who've designed this and worked so hard to exactly match the patterns and the, and the fenestrations and the similar architectural features in the neighborhood 
to be able to go over what, what they've done and why we've designed and responded to the comments from the Historic Commission, as well as the planning board in our redesign, which I might add, are not just throwing things on to try to respond to things, but are in fact an attempt, and I believe successfully so, at addressing the issues and the transition of the commercial use on the commercial property against a residential property. Um, Andy, if you could go to the, uh, I don't know what slide it is. Um, if you could go to the slide where uh, you look, there's a view down uh, Prospect Street from with your back towards fruit. Um, and it's uh, one of the last renderings from Tangrams prior to 22, maybe 23. Uh, Ms. Mead, how, um, how much longer do you think you'll need to make your point? Um, well, I'd like uh, I'd like a few more minutes, and I guess I'd like to ask the chair if um, you're going to allow any of our um, consultants to speak. Um, well, well, let's let's see how the time goes. I'm to be perfectly honest. I'm I'm not sure it's necessary um, because you know we've we've had time with the plans. We can see how uh, we're familiar with the history. Can you know we we we're dealing with what is on the table today. Uh, I, I take your point about um, it, what's gone on historically. It's as far as I'm concerned, it's not off the table, but it's that's not what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about what's proposed today and its context. And I'll just one comment in response to your. Um, appeal to the zoning uh, and districting and the zoning regulations and so on. That's true. It's a commercial district. Those zoning laws apply. That's very true. It's also true that those zoning laws are designed around a commercial uh, business district. The, the downtown overlay district ordinance was specifically written for the purpose of historic preservation. So they are two different things. Our purview is part of the overview process in regarding to downtown overlay district and, and preserving Newburyport's cultural and historical heritage. We are not concerned with the setbacks, the heights and so on other than the comments we made about how the heights may impact the neighborhood, you know, in terms of its historic uh, relevance and so on. So, uh, you know, I'm not, you're, you're quite right that it's a commercial district, et cetera, but that doesn't, you know, that in no way uh, means that uh, that zo those zoning laws somehow trump or overrule or make uh, uh, in, invalid uh, whatever comments we might want to make as far as uh, the historical context. No, and Mr. Chair, with all due respect, and if you'd like to arbitrarily go forward, that's fine. However, I would point out that you cannot just, the DOD doesn't just all of a sudden become on its own. It is an overlay district on top of the B2 district. Mm -hmm. yep. And the historical setting is a contextual matter, not just historic buildings, but the historic setting is the historic commercial district with historic zoning patterns. That's the historic setting. That's mm -hmm. my point. And okay. while I agree your purview is not to apply the zoning, you certainly can't just dismiss it. And you certainly just can't <laughs> dismiss the fact that there's a 1980 structure on the property. So well, in a in a sense, we can because we're not the we're not the permit granting authority. We we don't have the final say as to, and that's that's why the planning board needs to take all those things into consideration, and I'm sure they will. Your purview that you just discounted. You have an obligation to understand the entire setting, just like mm -hmm. you can say, well, oh, the 1980 building, we're not going to count it because I don't like it, and it's not the 1871 building. It's part of the historic structure. It's part of the struct the use of the lot. Yeah, I, I didn't hear anyone say that, by the way. Well, uh, I believe that Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Morgan and uh, the vice chair certainly did. It was mentioned in the context of calculating the volume and so on. So, but uh, I, I really want to move on because as I believe there are other people who want to make uh, public comment. So, um, you know, I, I hear you loud and clear. Um, and I, you know, your points are taken. 
did, is there, I don't want to cut you off arbitrarily, is there, was there something that you consider vitally important that you'd like to add? Um, well, we, we think the whole thing is of vital importance and the context of the neighborhood as being shown on the, particularly on the renderings mm -hmm. down both Prospect Street and Otis Place in particular, and the way that the building fits on the lot as you move down Prospect Street um, is of vital importance. But obviously, mm -hmm. the commission's made their decision, so you might ought to go on. Well, well to, one, one correction. A, the, the, this commission has not, quote, made its decision, where, and, where, and there is no decision to be made in this case. It's a report that needs to be generated. It's not, quote, a decision. And it's, and it's, it's not a done deal. It's part of this discussion. And that's why we're listening to the comments from both you representing the applicant and uh, the general public, which I'm sure would like Haino has comments to make as well. I see there are hands raised there. So, uh, and if time permits me, we can come back to if there's comments that either um, your historical uh, expert would like to make or your architect would like to make. Uh, if, if we've got time, you know, by all means. Uh, I would like to be able to take at least some of the um, members of the public that have been waiting patiently um, to make a comment. Um, I'm, so um, I'm just going to take them in the order that they're showing up on the on my list here. And by the way, once you've been uh, acknowledged, uh, do um, put, take your hand back down. So let's see. Uh, I see some that's Christopher. Somebody's at the top of the list here. Let me just see if I can expose the list. Oh, okay. Christopher dash A R C. Yeah. Um. Um. To to be clear, I I have been um working with the bank. Um, okay. A little on this, but I I can keep my comments pretty brief. Um, okay. Thank you. I. I actually work very closely in Harvard Square Historical Commission. Um, I was actually on the commission for about two years. And I was brought to kind of mull through this issue. And, and, and I would like to make an, a, a kind of appeal to the, to the board here that, that you know, I think, I think the intent of trying to keep the character of uh, the downtown and how these buildings come into contact with neighborhoods is something that we've tried to be very thoughtful and careful about. It seems not to be reading very well. I think what, what we're trying to do here is look at a given program. The program is, is, is in a way a given. The, the expansion of the bank generates a certain volume of building. And that certain volume of building is, I, I have to just, be taken back a little bit to say it's massive. It, this is not a massive building. This is a building that is bigger than the next door house, but in the scale of a town or city or a commercial district, it is not a large building. It is a building that actually is, is very recognizable as a commercial building that should it have been built in the 1850s, would have been built in a similar set of materials, set of proportions, set of volumes, and it, it, it surprises me a bit to hear that, that the board would rather have um, a facade that looks kind of like a house that has a commercial function behind it than it would a well thoughtful commercial building envelope that has a commercial function behind it. I think there's a sort of authenticity that's being kind of ignored here that when you're building a commercial building, it should have its character intact. And this is a character that is not foreign to the other commercial projects that come into contact with neighborhoods. And I, it, it's a, I, I would ask the board to kind of come at it that way and, and look at how this, this addition approaches the, the problem in that way, given the fact that the idea of just lowering the height or just making the volume smaller is, is a programmatic issue that is not solvable at this point. Okay. Um, let me just uh, respond to one thing you said. Um, I, I, frankly, I agree with you that a commercial building should not look like a residence and vice versa. Um, what would, and th there is, it, it's kind of like the the comment I made about the bays. You know, it's like uh, a commercial building attempting, you know, having something that uh, is normally associated with a, a residence, 
and you know type of thing so it's actually you know agreeing with you there that that, that just don't read quite right i think what we're I don't think anyone is proposing, and you know, maybe Joe can respond to this as well, that uh, that we're in favor of a commercial building that is somehow masquerading as some kind of residence. I, I, I would agree that that wouldn't make sense from either a program point of view, architectural point of view, or probably any point of view, uh, but more, more the overall concept of somehow on that back area, better harmonizing with the, the neighborhood. So having said that, um, thank you for your, your comments. I didn't quite catch your last name. It says Christopher. Angelakis, A-N-G-E-L-A-K-I-S. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Angelakis. Okay, um, let's see, we have uh, several other people who want to speak. Uh, the next one I'm showing up on my list is Peter Mackin. Uh, if you're, okay, and. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, Peter. Oh, wonderful. Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, my name is Peter Mackin. I live at uh, 1113 uh, Prospect Street, directly across from the garage, um, as it shows in the renderings. Um, and um, I will assume that, uh, that the historical committee has received my letter and reviewed it. Uh, and I will assume, uh, I hope this is correct, that each of you have had the opportunity to actually visit the site and visualize what this 30 foot high building that is about the size of, of the width of a, of a third of a football field uh, directly across from the, the homes on Prospect Street uh, would look like once it's in place because it totally changes the fabric of the neighborhood. Uh, I would tend to agree uh, with you, Mr. Richards, um, that maybe it's um, inherent uh, that there's a conflict between uh, trying, being able to do what the bank's trying to do in this location. I totally respect the bank, its operations, its history, and so forth, and the effort that they've made with regard to putting together uh, architectural plans so that we'd all understand what they're trying to do. Um, but a 30-foot brick building just overwhelms and the the area it's it has an industrial look and feel it it's all brick makes it very cramped and overpowering on prospect street and otis and for that matter garden street and um and i would ask if the bank has considered any other options i.e making it a one-story building 14 to 15 feet high i.e putting a large brick building on State Street where all of the other large um, buildings um, that are made out of brick uh, exist up and down State Street, or even putting those employees that do whatever that department does in another location um, of the bank or a new location. Um, and then I would just say that, um, you know, the, uh, I look at setback is part of the look and feel of an historic area. And with only a seven foot setback from the curb, it is, it just, it just, just overwhelms you and makes a tunnel effect on prospect. I would, I appreciate the fact that they showed us pictures of, um, of Prince Street and Independent Street. Uh, and I ask everybody there, is that the historical look and feel that we want for Newburyport? and want to duplicate that here on Prospect and Otis? Uh, uh, I don't think it is. Uh, and if, if this happens on, on Prospect, I ask myself, where next in, in Newburyport will such a look and feel of an industrial overpowering um, uh, street exist next? Who else would want to do this? And, and that's where, where I really, just as Lisa Mead has been very passionate uh, about her feelings, I can assure you that the entire neighborhood is just as um, passionate about these things. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to comment. Okay, you're, you're quite welcome. Um, and I thought I heard um, Ms. Mead say that the height isn't 30 feet, it's like 26 feet. So I looked again at the plans and I'm pretty sure I'm reading them correctly that the height of the addition is 30 feet above uh, average grade there. 
Anyway, um, uh, let's see who else we got. Jeff Caswell, do you want to um, unmute yourself if you'd like to uh, speak? Hey, yes, you may. We can hear you. Uh, my name is Jeff Caswell. I actually own 7080 State Street, which is also a historic building on State Street in a butter to answer savings. I can understand these people's in Otis Place, the concern, but this is a B1 business. And I think in the context, if you stood on Purchase Street, looking towards the, lot, the uh, library, I think it fits within what's going on. Yes, it's a residential R3 behind it, but that's a B1 by right district. And obviously the heights rendered by them having to have parking. I'm sure they don't want to have that lower level, but they're obviously forced to do that. And that's what's driving the height. But having run a business, which I do, and trying to keep people in New Report, which we vitally do need to do to engage New Report downtown, we need people working there. If maybe the zoning lacks their parking requirements, you'd have a different building. But this is kind of what is going on. It's a B1, it's a business. I actually don't mind the brick. I don't live there. But I own property downtown. And I think this is very fitting with New Report. I grew up here. I think it fits well with the set. That's all. Thank you. Right. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Caswell. Appreciate it. Um, and yeah, the parking thing, I agree with you. That's uh, an issue. And I, you know, one thought that occurred to me, and don't take this as a concrete suggestion, just a thought that, you know, according to so many editorial writers to the paper, the, the new parking garage is, is underutilized. You know, maybe some arrangement could be made to, to I don't know, use part of that for remuneration to the city or something. At any rate, I digress. Um, uh, Susan Edwards, um, would you like to make a comment? Your next one showing up on my list here. Uh, on mute. Hi, actually, it's not Susan Edwards. Um, uh, I don't know why my Zoom account came in that way, but okay. sorry about that. Um, my name is Colleen Turner Sacchino, and I live at 15 Otis Place. Uh, I agree with Pete Mackin um, that the current plan is, it's not dealing with the massing and scale and size. Uh, I, I absolutely appreciate and respect what the Institute for Savings has contributed to our community, but that is irrelevant to this discussion. So to bring it up now, it, it's, it, it's whitewash. I, I, what they give is not what this is about. It's been universally expressed over, I don't know, by the board yourselves and by a few people who have already spoken that to introduce over 16,000 square feet or as um, Mr. Morgan, God, what a scary number, explained 241,000 cubic feet of additional volume to a residential neighborhood that abuts a city area is unacceptable. And sadly, most disturbing of all is this, they're proposing this enormous addition that'll primarily serve as a parking garage. Um, I don't think that's where it belongs. Um, P Patricia on your board explained at the start that the standards need to be sufficiently respective of existing and surrounding area. And I don't think that, um, this enormous brick building that's 30 some odd feet high, uh, 100 feet long, and uh, being built for about, I think we've seen in publications by the bank, seven new employees and dwarfs the original 1872 structure is um, historically related to the setting. Uh, as presented, I would have to say that it preserves no aspect or aesthetic of the existing community and neighborhood and the sheer masking, massing and scale is completely unreasonable. Um, I agree with Pete Mackin. Here's a concept, put the structure where the clock is and move the clock to the corner of Otis and Prospect. State Street is already designed and able to withstand a multi-level brick structure of this size and it would be suitable there not abutting up to our beautiful Greek, Victorian, and Italian um, homes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, uh, 
and I just see your hand, uh, Ms. Mead, so we, we'll try to get back to you in a minute. Um, the uh, Aaron Clausen, did you want to make a comment? Yes, this is actually Ann Kloss, and we live on 3 Otis Place, and I agree with Colleen and Peter. Um, we will be looking directly at the garage, and we believe the mass is too, obviously, too large, and the architecture does not fit in whatsoever with our community and our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for commenting. We appreciate you guys coming out. Um, Mr. Mark Griffin, I see next on my list here. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you now. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Richards. Um, Mark Griffin, I live at Four Otis Place, uh, along with my wife, Claire, Papa, nice to see you. I think she submitted a, uh, a letter for the Historical Commission's um, review, and I presume that you have uh, looked at that as well. Uh, we are uh, probably the closest of utters to uh, this project. Uh, if it's built as proposed, we'll be about six feet, um, you know, from the, the nearest building wall. Uh, as you're looking down the Otis Place uh, on the, the rendering that's on the screen right now, uh, we are the first house on the right after the proposed addition. Um, you know, it's a very small uh, house it's, and it's on a very small lot and we're close to the lot line. It was built that way in 1900. Um, and, you know, living next to a parking lot might not necessarily be the greatest, uh, you know, a butter uh, or, or a budding uh, view, but it certainly is much better than looking at a brick wall. Um, and this is what we'd be looking at. Uh, not to mention the fact that there would be a uh, employee walkway uh, right along the uh, proposed fence along the property line. So not just the brick wall, but also this is where everyone goes to work every day and goes home every day uh, right next to our house, which basically is our kitchen window. Um, so, you know, obviously we're uh, opposed to this as it's designed. Um, we uh, started out, in, you know, in opposition to this project, um, mainly uh, to try to get uh, a better design. Uh, the iterations that have uh, come through have all been quite similar uh, with, you know, marginal aesthetic changes, but none that have really addressed the size of the addition. Uh, the Historical Commission's advisory report, um, when it was uh, first drafted, uh, said, you know, as one travels down Prospect Street toward Otis Place, the addition quickly grows into a looming monolithic giant that is clearly not subordinate to the existing building. Um, there's been nothing in the subsequent iterations that has addressed that point. This is not subordinate to the original historic building. And so, I would urge the commission as um, I think uh, I was encouraged by many of the comments by the commissioners this evening uh, as to, you know, potential advice they might give to the planning board. Um, I would urge them to, uh, to address that particular point. It's too big, uh, it's too massive, um, and it's really not in the right place. Um, and just one final comment, and I don't want to belabor this, uh, but, you know, Mr. Ziemba's comments were entirely inappropriate for a commissioner on the NHC. Um, this is exactly what we abutters have dreaded all along, which is that the bank's influence in the city of Newburyport Mark. would sway commissioners' minds okay. and sway board members' minds. The guy was inappropriate. Uh, and, and that, to me, um, was validated by his comments this evening. Uh, all he did was talk about how great the applicant was not, he did not address the design of the project, which is his charge. Thank you. Okay, in, in defense of Ron, I would say that what I heard him say was, and you're right, it was, uh, he did speak about the bank's reputation, which we're all familiar with, and arguing that we should therefore um, give them a fair and uh, objective hearing. Um, which I don't think anyone can really argue with that, but uh, your thank you for your comments. Um, let's see, there's someone on the list called S. Sullivan. I 
Uh, you need to uh, locally unmute your own device, computer, phone, whatever, tablet, whatever you're using in order to be heard. Uh, still, yeah, but I'm not still not hearing anything either. Yeah. Okay, well, why don't we try someone else? Um, uh, this, and by the way, if you've already spoken. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, we can, we can who is speaking? Hello? Yeah, we hear you, who is, who is uh, speaking? This is, the, this is Sean Sullivan or S. Sullivan. Sorry, oh, okay. I, I, was, I was having some internet connections there. Yeah, I do. Um, Okay, my, my, and okay. hang on a second, Sean, uh, Mr. Solomon. The, um, we can, you know, if, if for those people who have already spoken, you're not necessarily, you know, Andy may or may not have muted you back again, please uh, locally mute yourself again. Like for example, Mr. Clausen, uh, your, uh, any, anyone who has already spoken. Uh, okay, Mr. Sullivan, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Richards. And um, uh, thank you uh, for, uh, I'm assuming that the board has read a, a letter that I had sent in uh, along with some drawings. I had sent them to the planning board as well. Uh, my name is Sean Sullivan. I live at uh, 9 Prospect Street, uh, directly across uh, from the uh, north side of the parking garage. Um, I, I appreciate all the thought that you put into the uh, original comments in, in your first uh, review of this and uh, also the very well thought out uh, comments here uh, tonight. Uh, I, I not only, I, I learn a lot about our, our town when I listen to you. Um, I also appreciate uh, the, the nice comments about the bank. Um, you know, I, I think it is uh, important to keep that in context. Um, it, I would never want to, uh, you know, make comments that would hinder their ability to, to run their business. Um, but, you know, I, I think that um, they've done so much for the community, but now they're, they're proposing something that, um, affects the historical nature of, of the neighborhood. Um, my first point is that the, it's going to scale in mass. Um, it's not subordinate to the original building and it's not subordinate to anything in the surrounding area. It's absolutely huge. Um, coming from my perspective, I'm the smallest house in the area, the lowest house, the lowest windows. I look at the front of the house that sometimes or the fenestration and you might as well design like big teeth on, on the tops and bottoms of, of those windows. It looks like it's gonna eat my house. Um, my windows, uh, the center of those are on the, the bottom or right on the tops of the, uh, the bottom windows there. This thing blocks out all of the light. And I would, uh, I would ask the, the board to look at the impact of a historic home and the functionality of that, uh, where this is, my house is a mainly south facing home from 1800. Um, and it's, you know, uh, I look at a structure as a living, breathing organism and, and, you know, sunlight and the traffic around it is all part of its environment. Um, this severely disrupts that and the livability of the home. And I, I hope you would uh, take that in consideration of, uh, of the impact of the historic area. Um, the other comment, and uh, some of my neighbors have mentioned the same thing, is that you know, uh, Ms. Mead had mentioned the fantasy and reality of this. The, the fantasy of this is that this somehow fits into this neighborhood. The reality of it is there's many other options that they could do to make it fit in better that they've not undertaken. Um, whether it's bringing it down a little bit, bringing it back a little bit, or bringing it up front where there's other brick structures on the property, whether off to either side, it would fit in perfectly well. Um, I, I really enjoyed uh, the overhead visual um, that I believe uh, Mrs. Pecknick had, had put up uh, to see the overview of how it used to be um, because we call this State Street, but most of that property used to be Prospect Street before it was merged. Um, and so I just hope that people can maybe take it, have an open mind to this and, and look to other places on the property where that, you know, function as a bank, the, the area, the square footage, um, and this is a parking garage. There's plenty of places to house the employees uh, for any kind of function there or elsewhere up there in a smaller size uh, and something that fits in more historically. And I just don't think that's even being seriously addressed by the bank. So I would appreciate your, uh, all the consideration that you've given to that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. 
<clears throat> Mrs. Sullivan, and I believe I, I believe I did see your document. Uh, you were the one that had the small older house, and you had some drawings that showed your house in comp comparison yeah. to some of the yeah. others, right? Yeah, marked up. Yeah, I did see that. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think we're getting down to a, just a couple more. Uh, I see a Tim Wacker in the uh, list. Is, uh, is Mr. Wacker or available? Can't see. Hello, hello. Am I coming in now? Yep, yep, you are. Just speak up and yes, we can hear you now. Oh, terrific. I just wanted to say, I, um, based on all the comments I've heard tonight, I'm not sure how the uh, Historic Commission can submit a recommendation to the Planning Board. Uh, whatever uh, surface treatments the building gets, it's still basically a box that's being dropped into a architecturally detailed and in many respects unique neighborhood. So, uh, I, you know, it seems to me that this can't fit. I, I don't know how you can submit a recommendation uh, to change this building other than I think moving it forward. That's the, an idea that I just heard for the first time tonight. I think it's a very good idea, but any way you cut it, if that building gets built to those dimensions and it seems like IFS is not gonna yield on those dimensions, it is going to be a hardship that weighed, is weighed upon Otis Street and um, Prospect Street. I mean, uh, Mr. Ziamba's remarks are certainly, they, they resonate uh, for the entire city, but at the end of the day, uh, it's gonna be our neighborhood that pays wh whatever indebtedness Mr. Ziamba seems to think the, the city as a whole uh, has toward um, IFS. So I, again, I, I just, this, this project seems to be a non-starter for me. And uh, you know, it, all of the comments tonight seem to bear that out. So I, I, I wish you luck, but I just don't see how you can <laughs> submit, a, I don't see how you can submit a recommendation other than that it is not the appropriate place for this structure. And I, I can't for the life of me understand why they don't build it on State Street. Thank okay. you. All right, well, that's my problem, Mr. Wacker, to try to figure out. And once again, I'd like to remind everyone uh, that, uh, again, you know, please don't attack our colleague, uh, Ron, for his, for his uh, comments. I, I, what I heard him saying was that we just need to have respect for the institution and give them a fair, a fair shake, so to speak. Not that that would necessarily um, derail our normal deliberations or make, you know, push us into something that we wouldn't ordinarily do. And, and Ronald, certainly, you're certainly welcome to uh, comment to those uh, comments as well, if you want. But we're almost through our uh, attendees who wish to speak. Um, let's see, we have oh, one more. And, and by the way, when you after you've spoken, you can put yourself back on mute and lower your hand. Uh, I've got a Claire Papanastasu. Papanastasu or something. I'm sorry, I'm remembering your last <laughs> name. There. Uh, yes, and you actually pronounced it correctly the first time. Ah. Papa, nice to see you. Ah, okay. Like, Papa, nice to see you. Exactly. Um, uh, thank you. Number one, my name is uh, Clay Papa, nice to see you. I live at Four Otis Place. My husband is Mark Griffin. Uh, we are the closest to Butters to the proposed project. And in order to just move this along, I know it's late. Um, I agree with all my Butters who have. Um, uh, spoken against the 6,000 square foot addition. Um, and also I want to thank the commission for really being very thoughtful about this and very thorough. Um, thank you. But to, to be brief, this comes, comes down to two things for me. One is the massing is massive. It's, it's huge, okay? So let's, you know, let's address that. And number two, the bank can do better. So that's all I'd like to say. So thank you. Okay, well, I certainly thank you for being uh, uh, very pleasantly brief. That's <laughs> well, I agree much with all my butters, so why right. rehash, correct? So let's just. Yeah. Um, actually, I was taking notes here. Um, give the others, it was, it's, it's massive. And you, thank you. I, have, I had the beginnings of a phrase here thanks for something, but, but then for I stop it. For yeah. who? Where? Pardon this is, I'm trying to summarize your comments from my notes here. Oh, I'm a fast talker, so my apologies there. So, all right, so. All right. I wanted to thank the commission for its thoughtful comments. Oh, okay. 
I didn't want that to You're go welcome. unnoticed. <laughs> okay, I, I, very good. Appreciate it. Okay, we're almost through. Um, uh, now, uh, Ms. Mead, I know your hand has been up for a while, and I know you, you've spoken before, but I know you, your, your name has come up a couple of times in other comments, so I think it's only fair to give you a chance to make a, a brief um, final comment if you would still like to do so. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think that facts are particularly important, and I would like to correct a couple things that have been said. Um, I did not say that the new addition was 26 feet. In fact, the okay. new addition was 29 feet, 8 inches. Uh, and the relative average of the eave lines of the surrounding houses is at 130 elevation. And so that may be your confusion on the plans. There are both uh, the height in feet as well as in elevation. Mm -hmm. uh, additionally, uh, there was a comment earlier about uh, that the, the bank needed to be set back from the street um, to be consistent. Well, in fact, um, all of the ha all of the buildings on State Street, on Prospect Street, on Otis Street are all immediately on the sidewalk. And contrary, this bank building, proposed building, is set back to provide a, a relative um, space between the pedestrian and the building itself. Um, and so if you look down this street, you'll see on Otis, there are nothing, there's nothing in front of those houses except for a couple bushes right here on the corner. If you look at this street, I think it's slide 24, Andy, and look down Pros uh, Prospect Street. Thank you very much. Um, you can see, and this is actually a really good photo, that those houses are immediately on the sidewalk. And of course, many of these steps are into the sidewalk. The bank is set back from the sidewalk and has landscaping. What is also very good about this particular photograph is you can see the eave line of the bank or the, or the edge is at the um, eave line of the houses across the street. And what is of particular note is that the way these houses look together as you look down the street is they look as one and they don't look like single individual houses. And so to say that this proposal is different than what exists in the neighborhood, I believe is just wrong. Um, and I wanted to make those factual um, comments um, clear, and I would actually ask the commission to consider that a setting is more than just what is immediately around, but is in fact a myriad of layers um, involved in what a setting is, as I described earlier. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mead. Um, the uh, the I don't, I don't recall actually even hearing that the bank had was required to set back. I'm fully aware that due to the commercial zoning and so forth and so on, I don't think that's, you know, you, you certainly more than meet that requirement. There's no argument there. And there's certainly no argument that the older houses um, in which many of us dwell, not only on Prospect and Otis Place, but also on, we're around the city, the older parts of the city are not set back from the sidewalk virtually at all. Yeah, <laughs> so no argument there. Right. There's a comment by an abutter that, in fact, oh, I see. right. Thank you. Okay. Well, maybe I, I, I maybe I missed that one then. Uh, the only thing I would take some issue with is existing houses read as one. Just looking at the street view, uh, the front elevations well are almost uh, on a on a plane, but it, you know, given the different textures, colors, designs, and so forth, well, to me, they don't read as one, but, you know, that's a difference of opinion. Um, I'm not saying one is right or one is wrong. Um, okay, well, I think, let me just double check. Um, I think everyone um, that had their hand up has spoken. Um, there's a couple of people whose hand is still raised, but I know they have spoken, so I'm assuming you just haven't taken your hand back down. So I'll go back to our panelists. Uh, uh, by panelists, I mean our commissioners. Would anyone else like to make any last comment uh, regarding this whole matter? It's awfully quiet out there. Okay, well, either you're getting tired or you don't have a comment or both, which is, which is okay. Well, I've been taking uh, a lot of notes. There's a lot for us to consider. Um, and I do take my uh, obligation seriously to take into consideration comments from everyone on the board and uh, from the abutters and 
fairly and uh, apply the, the standards that we that um, our, my vice chair Ms. Pecknick uh, read in the very beginning um, about you know what our charge actually is and so on. Uh, I'd reiterate that um, you know this is you know it, it's kind of a, a bit of a um, outlier so to speak in that it's not a formal uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, statutory requirement because we've already met that back around the end of February as far as the report to the uh, planning board which was already referenced uh, but again they did they did ask for us for an opinion on the revised plan so that's what uh, we're going to try to deliver to them in time for their um, review next week where <clears throat> this matter will be before the planning board and I would encourage I know the, the bank and its representatives will be there uh, to represent uh, their side of the story, so to speak, and I'm sure there'll be many <laughs> butters there as well, and uh, to hear not only the comment, the type of comments you aired tonight, but also other things that the planning board needs to take into consideration as the uh, governing body in this case. So with that, I thank you all for your, your public comment. I do want to move on to our agenda. You're welcome to uh, stick around if you like. Uh, the next matter on our agenda is a uh, um, discussion of, well, actually, it's a, fa a fairly straightforward matter. There was an item on the agenda for 14 Titcombe Street, that's the Central Congregational Church, about uh, uh, their preservation restriction. Uh, they have asked to that we grant them a con uh, continuation. So I will uh, go ahead and make a motion that we continue that item without prejudice to the meeting of July 9. Uh, is there someone available to second that motion? I'll second that. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Mr. Uh, Fay. Yep. I believe that was Chris Fay. Uh, so let's do the roll on that. Uh, Chris, are you a yes on that? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, Patricia? Yes. Okay, um, Ron? Yes. Okay, uh, Joe Morgan? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, myself is a yes. It's one, two, three, four. I'm missing some. P oh, Peter. Sorry. Yeah. You've been quiet for so long. Okay. Peter is yes. Thank you, Peter. Okay. So we'll continue that one and when I think uh, they are planning to uh, join us to, to talk about that on the 9th. Uh, there's an, uh, another item on our agenda for tonight is 342 Merrimack Street. Um, you recall the, we had a fairly extensive meeting at which at the conclusion of which we came up with a, an approved plan. This was um, where the, let's say this, that was the second uh, hearing of that particular uh, property or project. And they, the, the applicant and council had come back with uh, significantly revised um, <clears throat> plans, which uh, addressed many of the concerns. And during the meeting, we pretty much addressed the remainder of them. Uh, and we submitted our past our findings along uh, to the planning board, the uh, who is has a number of uh, issues to resolve as far as there's section 6b or whatever it is, uh, there's a uh, preservation restriction and so on. In the planning board meeting at, at which this was discussed, the someone on the board asked about the existence or non-existence of shutters, which are shown on the, the property on the form B. I believe they're on the property today. They are not on the approved plans. Um, so they asked, uh, does the, um, the historical commission have any opinion on that? So I said, I would go back to the, the board, which is you folks and ask about that. In the meantime, I know I've done a little uh, digging and a little research and I know uh, Patricia has, and I'm not sure if others have as well. I can tell you that in my, uh, well, in my digging, all I can come up with is that the answer is some Greek Victoria, Greek revivals, pardon me, had it, some did not. Uh, it does not necessarily appear to be a standard of that particular style. Uh, it has seems to have a lot to do with the history of that particular house. It's interesting to note that the virtual twin house, which was also an older house converted, uh, was owned by the same owner, courier, uh, has the same kind of uh, Greek revival trim, etc. does not have shutters. Um, 
it has an it has a different treatment to the front entry. There's also a very similar house right on Merrimack Street, just a few doors down towards downtown, that does have shutters and it has a type of um, entry that I think the um, uh, applicant of 342 would uh, would do well to look at. It looks a lot like uh, how their entry uh, looks a lot like how they've designed their entry to look like when they're all done. At any rate, uh, so. Um, I have a motion kind of drafted, but before I go ahead and just read that, I'd like to see if anyone on the commission would like to comment or have a question. And I see one hand went up. Uh, Ms. Pecknick, did you want to make a comment? You're muted locally, uh, Patricia. Okay, yeah. So I, the secretary standards recommend against removing historic shutters. So I was trying to figure out if these are historic. And like you, I, I consulted, you know, the field guide to American houses and it says some did, some didn't. Uh, there's a book, Restoring Your Historic House by Scott Hansen that has a whole section on federal houses that were updated during the Greek revival period. And again, like you, I looked at to Mary Mac Court, um, which in its form B has shutters, but now doesn't. And as since it's an addable and removable feature, I don't take a position that the applicant should be required to repair or replace them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Anyone else have a comment on that? Give it going once, going twice. Okay, well, I'll read the motion I've drafted. Uh, the motion reads as follows. It is the opinion of the NHC that neither the presence nor absence of shutters on 342 American Street would have an adverse impact on the historical value of the structure or its contribution to the locale. So, um, anyone care to second that or, or not? I'll second, I'll second that. Uh, that sounded like Ron, did I get that right? Yes. Okay, thank you, Ron. Okay, so let's go through our roll call, Ron, since you were just speaking, your vote? Yes. Okay, hang on a second. Uh, okay, uh, Patricia? Yes. Okay, uh, Christopher Fay? Yes. Okay, Joe Morgan? Yes. Okay, uh, Peter? Yes. Okay, and me, yes. That's one, two, three. Okay, so that's six votes. So I'll pass that along to the board. I'm not sure what, you know, what they'll do with it either way. It does not affect our uh, decision that had already been made. Um, my, again, once again, I know I've expressed this before, but I'll express my appreciation to the applicants if they're listening. Uh, we appreciate their um, sensitivity to preservation uh, and, and what, you know, their willingness to do what preservation requires uh, in order to secure their preservation restrictions and so on. I think both the location and the property will be better off for it. So uh, appreciate that. Uh, so the only thing left then on our agenda is approval of the minutes from June 11. And I know there was some updates. Uh, there was a rather complex um, motion because it, it tried to incorporate the various, it was on 342 Merrimack, in fact, because we were trying to incorporate into the motion all the things that had been agreed to during the meeting. I think we got all those. I know I've uh, passed them on to both the planning board staff, excuse me, the, uh, sorry, the planning staff in City Hall and to uh, the applicant, their attorney and so on. Uh, so um, is there a motion to approve uh, the minutes as amended? I'll make that motion to approve the minutes as amended. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fay. As that, and I'll go ahead and second that for the sake of time. So, Chris, as you were speaking, um, second, I'm running out of space here. To take notes. Okay, so Christopher, approval of minutes. I assume you're a yes. Yes. Okay, I am a yes. Uh, Patricia. Yes. Okay, uh, Mr. McNamee? Yes. Okay, uh, Mr. Ziemba? Yes. Okay, and Mr. Morgan? Yes. Okay, so those are approved. Uh, does anyone have any last um, comments, anything before we take a motion to adjourn? 
I, I want to thank everybody. This is this is a very this is a very long meeting. Um, we've been thinking about this for five months. We're all volunteers. We put a lot of work and thought into it, and I appreciate it. This is the first big proposed project in the DoD since the ordinance was amended last August, and I think that um, everyone should be proud of all the all the effort that they made. I also really want to thank um, Gretchen our note taker who does such a fantastic job capturing some very dynamic, complicated discussions. Hey, yes, here, here, I'll, I will echo that. Uh, thank you, Gretchen, for your kind of unsung hero this going on in the, quietly in the background, doing your best to follow everything along and then doing it well. Okay, thank you, uh, Patricia. As long as your mic is still open, would you like to make a motion to adjourn? Um, just sure, Richard. Sure. What was that? This is Andy. Yes. Yes. It sounded like uh, Andy Port was trying to get a word in advice or not. Yeah, I apologize. Thank you. I just, could you clarify uh, what you're expecting at this point as far as comments uh, or to the timing of comments to the planning board for the institution? Sure. Um, I, what I told uh, the planning board chair, Bonnie Sontag, was that I, um, would do my best to have them in time for their meeting. What that translates into more concretely is my goal is to have it to them before the end of the workday uh, into your office tomorrow. I know uh, when the, in normal city hall hours, you guys leave early on Friday. How, how late were you, are you guys planning to be there tomorrow? Uh, well, I can, we can make sure that we check our email late in the day. I can check that if you make sure that I'm copied, I can then forward right. that to the board. Okay. So and that was that was one of the reasons I asked members to uh, kind of write up some of their comments um, so I can do some copy pasting, hopefully not screwing that up, but basically uh, kind of maybe hopefully put together some of their stuff um, as quickly as possible. And while people while the public was commenting tonight, I was actually typing them into a live document as we were working. So I've already got a lot of that input done. So that, so that's my goal. Uh, I'll give it my best shot and, um, and we'll see if we can't uh, make that happen. Does that answer your question? Uh, it, it does, yes, thank you. I guess I um, one of the what I sort of, perhaps it's a comment or a question, but uh, it wasn't apparent to me from some of the comments that were made this evening whether or not those comments to the planning board might be uh, a list of some of the comments per se from various members versus um, one unified vote of comment that says these are the particular adjustments to the plans that would be more compatible or appropriate or not. Um, I wasn't sure, it sounds to me like in this yeah. particular case that there might be more comments for the board's consideration, but not necessarily direction to the applicant or board that a specific set of changes be made. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's kind of a, uh, <laughs> as the great Buddha once said, the middle path in the sense that um, uh, it's neither strictly just a random, quasi-random listing of various comments. I don't think that would be it would be somewhat helpful, but not as helpful. I think probably perhaps the most helpful would be a unified direction. I'm not sure we're, we're really fully there uh, on that. Uh, I think that, however, I do think there are uh, general trends that I certainly sense, and I think uh, an impartial observer would could certainly sense some of the trends and suggestions that have been made. Um, so I will try to capture those and portray them as the kind of the, the overall, you know, where we're trending and some of the, the thoughts and ideas and what we think about uh, how the standards apply, how, the, how they can look at this particular project in light and the context of the standards and the context of the neighborhood and so on. Uh, there were a couple, there were a couple of interesting comments from the public that I think I'd like to, you know, include that, you know, I, that, for example, uh, the notion of perhaps a different location on their property that, that honestly hadn't even occurred to me, but, you know, and I'm not sure if that would work or not, but, you know, gee, that's something I hadn't thought of. So there are a few things that are worth, um, you know, just throwing in as, food for thought, so to speak. You know, I don't, I don't envy their job, frankly, and I, I'm not even gonna attempt to do it for them. I, they, they don't have an enviable task in trying to figure out what to do about this particular project, and I wish them luck in doing it. But I'll try my best to, to give them as much guidance as I can without 
uh, putting words in people's mouths or uh, assuming more than I should as far as what the commissioners have said. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Okay, having done that, I think someone was about to make a motion to adjourn, were they? I make a motion to adjourn. You do. Oh, thank you, Ms. Pecknick. Uh, I'll, I'll second it. <laughs> okay, so we'll go around the board. Uh, hang on. Um, Patricia? Yes. Okay, and I'm a yes, as long as I'm talking. Uh, Mr. Ziemba? Yes. Okay. Uh, Joe Morgan? Yes, thank you. Okay, Peter? Yes. Okay, um, who did I miss? Uh, Christopher? Yes. Okay, that makes all six of us. And we gotta figure out what to do about uh, Ron, maybe have the city chip in and buy him a new iPad or something. Um, I'm excuse me, about Malcolm rather. Um, okay, well, thank you all for, for sticking with it. Uh, somewhat long meeting, I tried to uh, uh, keep things more or less uh, on track. And, uh, you know, given the task, I think, you know, did okay. And um, with that, we can end the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.